For now, let's start. Claudia, it's you, and you're most welcome here on stage again, because you did, on the Shah 2017, you did a, a writing workshop for nerds, didn't you? Here today. Huh. Oh. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> yes, here but, I am. So you've, you've been here before. You know what it is about nerds and writing. Um, and, and you write yourself as well. Uh, she writes novels. Um, uh, I would, I would call that krimis, or is that not? Crime yeah. novels, yes. Crime novels, yeah. Crime novels, um, um, which are probably mostly fiction, uh, but you also wrote a non-fiction book on how to be safe on the internet. And, what, and to, so, so you're really involved in, in both fiction and in fact. So for today, uh, I think it's an international saying, truth is stranger than fiction. We have the same in Dutch, and I tend to turn that around. Um, fiction is stranger than truth. So, no, it, what is it? Truth is stranger than fiction? Nah, nah, I was going for the other one, not the truth is stranger than fiction. Yes, but, and yeah. currently is. Yeah. yeah. But I, I, I was going actually for the other saying. Uh, how was it's it? It's too good to be true. And now it's but too in true this case, to be it's, good. Yeah, it's too true to be good. So we live in a very strange world. So what can a storyteller writer do about that? Especially in a sense of science fiction and dystopian nonsense that we're going to have here. Starting, <laughs> yes. yeah, starting now. Claudia, all Thank yours. Thank you. Hello, yes, uh, thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, my name is Claudia, uh, or Jinx, and yeah, I'm, I'm an author, I'm a podcast host. I do uh, stuff with data security, um, and uh, I'm a former project manager in web development for several years, so I know a bit of the technical stuff. Um, and yeah, the, the big question we have today is, um, What's an author actually doing? This is what most uh, nerdy people ask themselves. Uh, actually, I'm asking that myself uh, too, most of the time. And um, as my lovely Harold, whose name I've just forgotten, Eric. Hi, Eric. How, uh, as Eric just said, the big question is, how do we write stories today when the outside is getting so strange? It's already like a dystopia that what we're living in. How can we create novels? How can we create movies? How can we create stories that still get people's attention and that can, can be loved by people when the reality world is already kind of a dystopian story? Um, the thing is, uh, we will be doing uh, a bit of storytelling ourselves here today. So you are going to uh, develop a story together with me. I will tell you how. Um, and the other thing is, the other lovely Harold, who's not called Eric, what was your name again? Milton. Milton, thank you. Milton is going around with the microphone, and um, you are encouraged, and I beg you to um, help me or help us all to create a story together. Okay, so you're prepared to uh, interact with the story we're creating here. But a bit of uh, things uh, first. Why do we tell stories? Any idea? Teaching? Teaching? To convey meaningful points, to convey meaningful points yes. Any other ideas? To share concepts. To share concepts. Entertainment. Entertainment. Yes. Live lives in, uh, just ah, yes. Live different lives in a book or a movie or a theater piece or whatever. Yes. And we're doing that for like for forever. So we've 
as humans. Humans have always told stories from the very beginning. And uh, there are those um, um, signings on, on walls that are basically stories too. How did uh, our tribe get the mammoth? And so on. So those are very early stories that have been told throughout the times. It's a basic human thing, like talking, like having some kind of religious concept or life concept. And stories are one of those concepts we as human beings have. Um, today, telling stories today is, is a, a quite interesting thing because we do not only mirror what's happening in society, in our books and movies and so on, but um, we contribute to the overall discussion. We change what's happening in society. We bring up the concepts and the ideas. One of you said that earlier, bringing up concepts and ideas into the overall discussion of our society. And we decide in books which topics are relevant. So even smaller authors or authors with not such a big influence like Andreas Eschbach or so, who has millions of readers, but also small authors like me with a few hundred or a few thousand readers, we do have an influence on how and what is discussed in our society. So if we reach 30 people, then we have 30 people who get our ideas in their heads and we're really close to people with our texts and our books and our stories in the heads of our readers. And if we reach 300 people and 300 people go out and talk about those topics, then we've reached at least 300, 600 and so on people. And even more if we're getting more attention, our books are being sold more and so on. And the thing is, it's not only relevant for us as authors, but it's relevant for like everyone. So what are the topics of our, of our society today? Ideas? Crime. Crime. Health. Health. Global threats, yes, of course. IT security, to mention? Nah, <laughs> not, not that important, yeah. Dystopias, yeah. AI. AI, it's a topic, yes. Other ideas over there, probably. Maybe? <laughs> question is, why didn't we as a society did not remember as a whole that there was a flu pandemic in 1921 and everyone was wearing masks? Why? Any idea? Yeah? No one wrote a good story. No one wrote a good story, right. Or a story at all. Uh, actually, I don't know any story about the, the, the flu pandemic as a, as a novel or such. I know there's uh, one or two uh, non-fiction books on it, but we as a society forgot about it. We just forgot it. It's just a hundred years old and we just forgot it. How could that happen? Because the discussion wasn't there in society. It wasn't a topic. It's what happens right now with the publishing industry. Publishers say, no, no, we don't take books on the pandemic. Nobody wants to read that. It's so awful out there. No, out there. Nobody wants to read um, books with uh, people wearing masks. We don't want that. And this is a thing of relevance. This is a thing where we have to take responsibility as authors, as publishers, to contribute to the discussion that this doesn't happen again, that the whole society or whole world of several societies just don't forget about it anymore. This is what happens if topics are not discussed. 
and are not taken into culture and pop culture. Well, how do we tell stories? Any idea? TikTok. TikTok, yeah. <laughs> yes? Pardon? Very short, yeah, very short stories, yeah. But in a visual format. Visual and audible, yes. Any other ideas? Pardon? Twitter. Pardon? Videos on YouTube, yes. We also tell jokes. We tell, we tell jokes, yes. Pardon? Books. Books, yes, of course. Magazines, papers. But they are all mediums. They are all media, of somehow. But how do we tell stories? Yeah. Beginning, middle, end. Uh, there's, you know, talking about uh, there and back again. That's one time. There's a Christian redemption. Maybe you want to take the microphone if you say more than two or three words that can easily repeat. Hello. Yes, um, there's a type of model that's there and back again, like Tolkien wrote, where you go out, have an adventure, and return to a safe nest. And then there's the one Hollywood likes, which is the Christian redemption story. A man is a cunt, and he sees that he's a cunt, and then he redeems, and he becomes a better person. Yes, and that's what we're doing today. <laughs> um, there is a, a, a person called, um, what was his... Uh, first name, Joseph, Joseph Campbell. Uh, he, in the 1940s, he did research and wrote uh, papers and, and, and a book about it. It's called The Hero's Journey. Who's heard of The Hero's Journey? Uh, about a third of the people here. Okay. Um, it's just what you said, and, and uh, we're coming to that in a bit. The first thing he found out is that humans all over the world are telling stories quite similarly. Not exactly the same, but quite similarly. And they're using a very similar structure all over the world. You have a hero, and she, get, uh, she goes out in the world. And then she lives there, and, and, and uh, things happen, and she reacts to them. And then she's growing on what she's, um, yeah, what she's living and on what she's uh, experiencing. And then, at some point, she has to fight a battle. And then she comes back. But where she comes back to, she has changed. And her old, ordinary world, where she started out from, it's a different world, suddenly, for her. And this is what we're experiencing right now. This outside has changed for us. We all have grown on the stories we've lived through over the last two or three years. And suddenly, our ordinary world isn't that ordinary anymore. Or are we still in our story world? Good question, getting there. The thing is, if, um, if we as authors and storytellers tell our stories and, and work with the topics we have today, as I said before, it's our responsibility to contribute to our culture, to contribute to our discussion. It's not that important that everything we tell, if it's about probably IT security, that everything is technically correct in the smallest detail, but it has to be plausible. Because what we're writing, uh, I said before, we're reaching people out there, we're contributing to the discussion, we're reaching also political decision makers. And suddenly, political decision makers think and actually believe it's really easy to do a hackback. And it's really a good idea to do that. Because everyone in this room is skilled enough to just hack 
let's say Sweden or China or the US, because this is something you can just do by being a hacker or a nerd. Because people write stories like that. Uh, no, it's not that important that, we, that this looks like it's done in a minute. It's not important that it looks like, oh, if you just pull out that, that screen cable, that uh, the internet connection is gone. Doesn't matter. Yeah, nobody's looking there that exactly. People look. People understand stories on a real basic level. We understand stories not here. We are understanding stories somewhere much, much deeper in our lizard brain. And this is where those fuzzy uh, ideas like, though this is totally easy to do hack bikes on whatever, the US, this is totally easy to do that. This, they understand it on this basic level. And we just can't have that. So this is, this is a, um, a bag I'm, I'm, I'm giving out in the world to all fellow writers. Please don't do that. Please write plausible um, stories. They don't have to be exact. They just have to be plausible or realistic in a tiny bit. Okay. What do we need to tell stories? Anyone? Idea? What do we need to tell a story? <laughs> Social cohesion, yeah. Pardon? Maybe into the microphone. Uh, to learn from things that happened before, so to remember stuff that happened so we can become better. Yes. You're one or two steps ahead of me. <laughs> no problem. No, I'm thinking about uh, things like we need some characters doing stuff for, for a start. Probably we need something like a location or several locations. And then we need stuff that happens. Three, three basic ingredients that we need for a story. And then if authors get to their work, there are yeah, the, the two far ends of how to write a story. Any idea? Same session? Yeah, so perspective is a, a, a thing, yes. But I'm at the author point currently, so uh, how can we write a story as an author, as a writer? The two far ends. Are, the two, uh, one far end are the plotters, people who plot their story. And the other side, the other far end are the so-called pantsers or discovery writers. People sitting on the bottom of their pants and discovering, uh, or they're, they're living their story while they're writing it. So they don't sit and make the, the most of the, the work in the beginning, but they're doing most of the work while writing and afterwards in, in rewriting and, and editing. Those are the two far ends and everyone you too, me too, is somewhere in, in the middle or at, at some point on that scale between plotter and pantser or discovery writer. Um, the thing is what we're doing today, we are plotting. Actually, over the years, um, I realized I really love plotting, but it can be too much. And this is a, a decision based on which project I'm working on. By the way, the project I'm currently working on is a sci-fi dystopia uh, that started here at Shah 
five years ago. So not the story world, but the idea of the book started here after that uh, creative writing workshop. Yeah, the beauty of plotting can look like that. Um, yeah, that's my pin board that I used to, uh, at home. This is how I'm actually working currently with lots of small cards, writing my ideas on, on them and putting them in, in a matrix. I'm doing that like that uh, only for a few years now, but that all started at university when I came across that book. It was, must have been 1999 or 2000. Um, one, of, one of the earlier semesters when I was studying English literature. There's a much newer version today. So there was a, like a 25 years uh, special edition of it. And Christopher Vogler, he took what that Joseph Campbell found out, and in the 1980s, he put that in a, um, in a structure that Hollywood authors could work with. So he yeah, um, translated the, uh, the work of Campbell into uh, something really handy for Hollywood authors. In the last 25 years, there have been lots of people working with story structure. And um, I had a look at it and compared some of them. And um, they all have still basically the same structure, the same, same matrix, but with a, some dif uh, differences between. So how does story structure work? Hmm. OK, generally we're talking about the story structure today, not so much about single characters and so on. Um, and the, what I'm talking about will have contents from Joseph Campbell, the hero with a thousand faces, uh, from Christopher Vogler, the writer's journey, Blake Snyder and Jessica Brody, Save the Cat, Ulrike Dietmann and Jurenka Jörg with a new version of the hero's journey as ah, taught at the Romanschule in Germany, and which is not yet included, but already somewhere in my mind is uh, Gail Carriger, the heroine's journey. So all what I'm talking about today, this will be uh, at the end again. So <laughs> um, these are um, yeah terms that are from four different hero's journey um, concepts. OK, let's start fresh. Let's take the board. Uh, the picture, by the way, is by Mats Berg, just to have said that. We're here. I hope you can see that a bit. So we have our board clean for today. I hope you can read that. Is it OK for you? Good. What the first thing we, uh, we know of our story, we're working in a three-act structure, that uh, beginning, middle, end thingy. Um, but the middle act, act two, is cut in half. Uh, so we have act one, act two A, act two B, and act three. This is our story structure for today. Um, there are, by the way, many more story structures, like uh, a story arc, a story mouse, that what um, uh, Aristoteles with his three-act um, structure and so on. So don't get nervous if, if you want to read into those things, that things could um, sound differently. OK, what we first know of our story structure is at the end of each of those acts, we have a, yeah, a, a turn into the next act or the next half act. So we have a break into act two. We have a midpoint in the middle. Uh, we have a break into act three. And we have the end, the final image, as 
which is from Blake Snyder. So if you think in the movie, we have that final image where we are working towards. What, were, what are we starting with? Well, oops, with the opening image. It was a bit too fast, but OK, we have our opening image, our ordinary world where we start at. What's our ordinary world? If we say we're doing a story today, what's our ordinary world now? The last four days were a bit different ordinary than the weeks before. That's right. So here at Hacker Camp at MCH, uh, our ordinary out there is quite different from mainstream society. That's probably true. OK, let's think of. So the setting here would be. It was a lovely sunny day at a hacker's camp somewhere in Netherlands. Okay, it was a sunny day at a hacker's camp, lovely hacker's camp in the Netherlands. Okay, who's our hero? Pardon? We see Eric crawling out of his tent. <laughs> Yes, our Harold Eric is crawling out of his tent. So this would be our first image, and Eric is our hero, obviously. <laughs> A Harold called Harold. OK? <laughs> OK, what we also have is who is Oh, oh, what we also have in story is meeting a mentor. A mentor who is going through the story for some parts together with the hero. Um, let's think Gandalf. Yeah? It could be a speaker that talks about a topic that he's very interested in. Okay, a speaker, yes. So let's go with a female speaker who he's always looked up to uh, and he's really looking forward to seeing her talk. Okay, so Harold is very looking forward to see a talk of a speaker he's always wanted to see. Um, okay, you're the speaker then. <laughs> okay, and what we also have as, as a concept in basically every story, and what we need to tell a story, are antagonists. What, uh, who, is our hero against up. So it can be a person, it can be a group of persons, it can be nature, or it can be something like climate change. It can be politicals, uh, who, politicians who don't want to change anything about uh, a system because it's cool to drive Porsches. I'm thinking it's the police. Something like the police, yeah, okay. I know the, the Dutch police went to see the Greenpeace people after they gave their talk. So how about, Eric doesn't know he's opposed to the police, but he's not the best of hackers, he's not the most popular of hackers, and then he discovers the person sitting or sort of in a tent next door is actually from the police here to investigate. Oh dear, and getting there in a minute. <laughs> getting there. Okay, getting there. <laughs> we can do that. By the way, uh, in the 1980s, who's uh, uh, as old as me may, may, may probably remember, in the 1980s, lots of stories, uh, lots of TV series and so on we saw um, had corrupt police in them. And at some point, not so many years later, like everyone, was thinking the police in the US are always corrupt. Some people nodding? Yeah. This is what I meant by our responsibility as writers, because we shape our society, we shape the beliefs of people. Like every policeman or policewoman is corrupt at least when they're living in the US. That has to be like that. They changed it. Currently, the police can do everything in shorter time than it needs to log in into a system. 
Um, this is what people think today. And this is what politicians think today. Not only you or me or the neighbor or our grandmother or anyone, also political decision makers think that way because culture is like that. And this is what culture tells you. Everything is so easy and just takes a minute or less. Okay, so we have our opening image. Harold is crawling out of his tent at a hacker camp. We have the mentor, the speaker who's giving a talk. And we have antagonists, probably we've seen them when we think in movie, yeah? Probably we've seen a police car somewhere out at the fence while we have this, um, yeah, a view over the camp or at the entrance. Okay, let's go on. We have a call to adventure. Something happens. What could that be? It was your idea with the police. So how does Harold actually get to know that the police is out there and is after that speaker? Hmm. Any ideas? Well. <laughs> Probably the microphone to Harold Eric or Harold Harold. <laughs> well, that's easy um, because, as somebody already mentioned, he is sleeping in a tent next to the, pol the, 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 the police person. So he probably overheard it in the night somewhere. Oh, okay. He overheard. It at night, and an undercover policeman is in a tent next to Harold. Oh, okay, yes? Um, are, we are we painting ourselves into a corner a bit where we're putting the speaker in both the, the um, mentor situation and the damsel in distress situation, which makes it difficult for her to mentor Harold? Uh, yes and no. Because only, you have characters in a book, and they can actually change roles. So if we're thinking about, uh, OK, this is a beginner story, and we're the first, it's our first story ever, short story, 10 pages. And we have uh, people changing their roles uh, like on ev twice on every page. That I don't mean can be difficult, but... I don't mean difficult roles-wise. I mean practical. If the police is coming to take her away, she's not here to mentor Harold. Depends. For like 10 minutes, she can be. For 10 minutes, she can do that. Can you please talk in the microphone? Harold will grow to see that he's really the hero and can do just as much as the person he thought was his mentor. So that's, that will work out fine for us. <laughs> We're getting there a bit later, so let's talk about Act 3 when we're at Act 3. <laughs> okay, so we've got our call, whoops, call to adventure. And now we've got a, a longer time with its so-called debate. Okay, shall I, shall I tell anyone? Shall I tell people? Should I alarm the speaker? Should I go to the orga? Should I denote, burn down the tent? Should I... Did I, did I hear it correctly? Did I hear it correctly? Did I make a mistake when I overheard what was being said yesterday night? Or probably... What's my risk in telling? What's my risk in telling? Right. So there is a whole part of the story that's, yeah, undecided. What shall I do? And Harold is sitting in front of his tent, drinking his first morning coffee, not sure yet if he's alive or not, or called Harold at all. <laughs> and suddenly, it dawns on him, damn, I really heard that. So, and now, what's he doing now? Hmm. Yeah, first there's a refusal. Okay, no, I don't, don't want to have 
anything to do with that. It's too risky. Nah, come on. I'm, I'm not the real, real best guy to do that. Um, I can't, can't do anything. Why should I do, go to the police or why should I go to the org or whatever? Yeah. Because team cohesion. Because team cohesion, yes. And the hero in a story is always the character that changes the most throughout the whole story, who learns the most throughout the whole story. So at some point, because there was some author at the beginning who said, you, Harold, you are the hero. Come on. Yeah, at some point, he's crossing the threshold. This, he has to go out. He's exiting his tent. And now, yes. So we could say he goes to, before he crosses the threshold, he goes to the talk and the speaker that he's admired for so long announces that she's up to something that's sort of in the borderlands between good and bad. So now he has to think, oh, which one of them am I? And he talks to a person who's like the chat person that we always have in the American movies. Oh, he's good enough. He can do something. And then later that night, that guy's just out drunk and he sees police mobbing and that's the threshold ish. Getting there, getting there, because we're getting into act two, or act two A, actually. So this is the second part of the first half towards the midpoint between crossing the threshold, so actually getting into the story, going out, starting the travel, and the midpoint. This is what they call the promise of the premise. This is where all the trailer material comes from. So this is the fun and games part, also for the writer themselves, to live through everything we've got. Real hacking, real police, probably police harassing someone, probably other people coming into the whole action. People following each other with gators? People following each other, yes, with e-scooters or on motorized tents, yes, yes, that's, that's where it's happening. So, pardon? A low speed chase, yes, yes, people watching the fire show and the Tesla coils and all that, that would be happening and that fun and games part, except for those things that we actually need for the story, probably a bit later than we can put it in the story later. But the, the, real, the real fun part and showing everything we've got in our toolbox, this is Act 2A, towards the midpoint. And then, oh yes, and we have, of course, a B story. What's the B story? Idea? Less story yes, the less important storyline or the second storyline, like probably a love story. So Harold could find a new boyfriend or a new life partner of which uh, definition at all. Who's a police officer? Who's a police officer? <laughs> right. So. Act 2A often starts, in movies at least, with the B story. Whoopsie. Yeah, and then the midpoint happens. The midpoint is always, mostly, either a wrong victory or a wrong defeat. When we're saying, okay, we're talking about uh, this should be a dystopia, then the midpoint would be a wrong victory, because everything looks good. And afterwards, everything just goes down. If we're saying, OK, Harold may have uh, a happy ending and may have uh, a, a great story, and um, the story is supposed to go out the positive way, 
then the midpoint would be a wrong defeat. Oh no, they actually arrested her. Oh dear, what now? Hmm. Let's look into Act 2B. The bad guys close in. Long time of Act 2B. So now it starts getting really, really down. So what could happen there? We need an interrogation scene, yes. And because this is a hacker camp, someone was hacking into the police office faster than it takes to log into Windows 10. <laughs> and then half of the camp can hear what's actually being said in, the, in that interrogation, probably. Yes. Pardon? In a silent disco with a green uh, Oh, lights. yes, in the, silent, in the silent lounge, when you're sitting there with half... Because they don't have sound. <laughs> Good one, yeah, in, with, with a green headset that doesn't have any sound. Sounds good. <laughs> yes. And then, there's that point, all is lost. Oh, no. They actually put her in the cell. Hmm. And it starts raining. And it starts raining at the camp. <laughs> yes. Lightning hits the abacus stage. Yes, the, the lightning hits the abacus stage. Pardon? All out of Marte. Out of Marte, Marte Calypso. Also, in movies, you mostly, in most movies, you have at that point the so called whiff of death. So you see something dead. Either there's a real death, or you see a dead plant or something, or uh, whatever. So in, in, in the movies, next time you see a movie and you see something dead, you're probably at the oldest lost point. Just think about it. OK. Then, Dark Knight of the Soul. It's a bit similar to the refusal of the call debate stuff. So, oh no, everything is lost. What can we do? We need someone who can break them out. Probably the lock picking people. Yes. This is the this is the part that was called ordeal at Fogler and Campbell. So it's real, real hard for Harold at that point. Okay, what to do? Now we're getting into, break, uh, into Act 3. They're taught a bit differently. In the US, it's uh, taught as an aha moment or for, um, for comedies. That could be an aha moment. So I can, I can uh, handle it that way and it could be better then. Or in the German tradition, or it's taught in, in Germany, it's an acid test and a failure of the hero. So, he, um, Harold goes to the lockpicking people, gets his team, they're going to the police, they're trying to get her out, and now they end up in cells themselves. Oh no, our failure. And we're sliding into the so-called finale. In the um, uh, Blake Snyder version, it's the whole act three is only called finale. Okay, great. <laughs> what does it mean? We don't know. At Campbell and Fogler, they have the more mythical approach with reward and the road back and the resurrection of the hero and the return with the elixir to his home village. Mm, not quite that, but what we learned from it. What I said earlier, we have a circle being closed in Act 3. So the hero comes back to his home world. So what we're thinking about now is how do we get Harold out of prison and all the rest and the speaker and back to Hacker Camp? 
probably the microphone over to Eric. Yeah, but I don't use that because that's differently. But, um, maybe because the, uh, uh, the B story, the boyfriend from the B story helps. Maybe the boyfriend from the B story helps. This is a good one. Okay, let's have a look at another thing. A catastrophe happens. So we're sitting in jail. Everyone is sitting in jail, probably except that boyfriend because he's not a skilled lock picker and was sent to get Marty. Oh, and this is the police officer, right. Hmm. So we have the other police officer, not a skilled lock picker, but he can get us inside information. We've got the maturing of the hero, Reifung in German. So he learns, okay, I can actually do stuff. I can be as good as the speaker herself. I can get us out of here. And then we've got things that he's, yeah, initiating. Yes, please. Uh, just a thought, go in the other direction, make him discover that his boyfriend is actually the bad guy here. Yeah. We can do that too. That explains that the whole arrest should never have happened, etc. And this is certainly a learning moment for him, a maturing moment. It is, but how can we get him out then? If, well, fraud vitiates everything in law, so the whole arrest should never have happened when that turns out. And now his big choice, I suppose, would be whether to rat on his boyfriend in the police and break up his potential life happiness or keep that quiet and become complicit. Hmm. Okay. So we need a character. So when we're saying, okay, we, we started out like that, and we're at that point. Yes, please. Yeah, I was more thinking that maybe the boyfriend had been sort of opposed to sort of, oh, no, I can't do anything. There may not be a police officer, but an IT person working for the police. And now they use that to crash the system or something. But if we go with the thing with the boyfriend being the reason for it, then he can break out, oh, but I know that this boyfriend likes so-and-so, so I can use that as his passport, and I saw password, and I saw something. So can I have my phone call? And he uses the phone call to access the police terminal and something. Go on. Of course, he knows the name of his dog. Oh, yes, he knows the name of his dog. This is really good. <laughs> and... Uh, the other thing is, I'm still missing the dragons. Since we've got two dragons on site, I think we should somehow get that fire-making dragon to the police station. Come on, for the, for the whole climax thing. We just need it for, for a bit. Just for the, for the visual effects. We could, we could say that the, the wild police was on site, because they were so evil, they also called the fire department for the dragons. But it turns out the firemen, or one of the firemen, is, is sort of in the same LGBT community as the hero. So therefore he says, oh, these dragons are fine, but I can use this to go to the police station and, I don't know, use my hose to get them out. Oh, oh, no, he has a, he's a fireman, he has a ladder. Great. <laughs> Okay, we're getting out of this. Good. And then, the whole end is, okay, we're wrapping up whatever we still have open. And, of course, we're going to the final image, as we think in movie. We're going to the final image, our changed hero. Probably has got some marks from the handcuffs or whatever, not, not the furry ones. Yeah, close to the, close to the MCH uh, Benzies. Um, and his new normal. And then we arrive at a new normal. Back at the hacker camp, and suddenly we see the world through Harold's eyes in a new light. Probably more blinky, with more Tesla coils, and probably even with Another boyfriend. The fireman. The fireman. Yes. 
And happily, that is the moment that Harold gets his own moment of fame on the stage. And of course, that's on clairvoyant stage because Abacus was hit by lightning. <laughs> Hooray! Thank you very much. Cheers. Harold? Claudia, thanks a million. This was great. This was lovely. It was fun. This was a, a, a huge... Um, uh, I would say it, it was a lovely waste of time, but it sounds, it sounds, <laughs> but it, uh, you know what I mean. Yes, and this is what we actually do as authors, that we write the stuff that brings all of us through times like pandemic, through times of war, by everyone having Netflix or books and so on, TV series, and that's the work of authors, thanks to all the lovely colleagues out there. All co-authors, thank you as well. Yes. Thank you.